Hello, everybody. Welcome. How are you doing? Everybody good? Beautiful Monday. Thanks for joining us. Okay, my name is Brett Hawk. I am the director of swim camps and clinics at Fitter and Faster. Today we're doing a special webinar uh, based on our mental skills training. So I really appreciate everybody joining us. We're going to be talking about commitment today. We've got two special guests that are going to join us. So it looks like pretty much everybody's jumped on now. So I'm going to introduce our first guest. His name is Carlos Clavery. He is an Olympian from Venezuela. He's currently training uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, where he swam at the University of Louisville for four years. And uh, he's in quarantine like the rest of us. I think he's down in Florida today. So welcome, Carlos. He's going to jump on here. There we are. What's up, buddy? Hey, how are you? Good, man. Where are you at right now? Uh, I'm at my parents' house in Boca Raton, Florida. Oh, okay. Excellent, man. Thanks for joining yeah, us. It's been nice. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. And also, uh, our other guest is Olympic gold medalist, the 200 backstroke, 2012 London Games. And he's our regular host here on Fitter and Faster Live TV. It's Tyler Clary. Welcome, Tyler, to the program. Hey, everybody. Now, Tyler, it's funny that we're talking about commitment today because... <laughs> You have some pretty good news that happened yesterday, right? That's right. I um, It wasn't exactly what we planned it to be, but I did get married yesterday. So sorry, everybody. Sorry, ladies. I'm a married man. <laughs> um, what men? What was that? So what about the men? Well, okay. Sorry for anybody that's interested. I'm now <laughs> tied down. How about that? Um, but yeah, no, we, we had originally planned on April 19th being the date. And, you know, we had quite a quite a lot of uh, guests that were signed up and ready to go and, and come here to celebrate with us. But unfortunately, you know, things happened a little bit differently. So it was just a group of six of us. But I was able to get most everybody's email in my family and everybody was on a Zoom call together. So we were able to have everybody there with us in spirit. Well, yeah, um, congratulations. And it looked like a beautiful day. And sorry, I couldn't be there, but it was... Uh... It was awesome. But listen, we're talking about commitment, so we're going to kind of dig into it a little bit. Um, I guess for you, why did you decide to make a commitment like this, Tyler? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it put me on the spot, man. Um, <laughs> no, it's it's one of those things where you know you look at you kind of look at life around you, right, and there are certain aspects about you know what you're doing and who you're with and you know whether or not i think it's pretty easy to tell whether or not that like you know has a positive impact on your life or has a positive positive impact on you as a person and yeah. um you know clark and i have been together for just over three years now and um everything has been you know positively benefited since i've met her you know i've uh I've, I think I've improved as a person, even though she might not think it, think that all the time. Um, and, you know, I think that we complement each other very well. So I think when you find a situation like that, that's clearly good for your, good for you, being able to commit to it, I think allows you to kind of just like go full bore into that aspect of life. Right. And I think as it, as a direct translation to sport, I always found that when I committed to my coach and my program, there was no no question that I was fully bought in, right? And I was able to get the most out of that situation, the most out of that training. And and now that I'm, you know, com completely committed to this relationship, you know, there's no there's no backing out. It's all about you know making it as good as I can possibly making it and being as good as possibly I can be. Yeah. Well, good stuff. Carlos, why do you think that we group commitment under the title of mental skills? Well, I think commitment is very important because it's mostly just an engagement and a compromise with yourself. So, for example, I after I was done with college, I told myself I was going to commit to pursue my career of swimming, right? And I was telling myself that, it was going to be hard because I don't have a team anymore in my back and, you know, this supporting staff that you have when you're in college. But 
I made that commitment to myself, to my parents, to my coaches. So that I was able to have that obligation with myself uh, so that I could continue with my career over the two years uh, until Olympics or God knows when. But um, so I think it's very important that before you commit to something that important, you have to put the pros and cons and just sit down with yourself and be like, okay, am I ready to commit fully? Because I am one of those people that like, if it's going to commit, it's going to commit 100%. I'm not going to do something 80% or 85 and just like, okay, I'm going to kind of swim and then do like something on the side. Like if I was going to commit, I was going to fully be in and give it my all. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember growing up, I can relate to that. You know, if there's probably a bunch of um, high school kids watching this right now, and there's a time in every swimmer's life where, um, kind of commitment slaps you in the face a little bit. Like I think swimming's fun and you enjoy it and, you know, you, you love going to practice and you love learning and, and pushing yourself, but you're not fully committed to it. You know, you're you're doing it because it's uh, it's just something that you do, you know, and you may do other things. You may do, you may play an instrument or you may do another sport. Like for me, I ran track and I played rugby in Australia growing up, you know, so... I did other things. It wasn't until um, it wasn't until my I had a I had a moment. And if you've been to any one of my clinics, I kind of talk about this moment in my clinic. Um, right around my fifteenth birthday, my dad bought me a bike, you know, and he told me that he wasn't going to take me to practice anymore because it was too early in the morning. Because practice for me started at five a.m. and he's like, "I'm not going to do that anymore. I've got to get to work. You know, I need my sleep." So if you want to go to practice, you're going to have to ride your bike to practice. And that meant I had to get out of bed at 4.15 in the morning to be in the pool at 5 a.m., you know. And at the age of 15, that's a big commitment. It's like, do I really want to do this? Uh, how much do I love this sport? And that's kind of when I had to make that decision of like, yeah, this is something that I really want to do for me. I'm not doing it for my parents. I'm not doing it for you know, some other reason. Um, I'm doing it because I love it and, and I want to be good at it. So at the age of 15, that's when commitment really hit me hard, you know, having to get out of bed and ride to practice. Um, Tyler, was there ever an instance like that for you that you can relate to? Yeah, well, um, I think every swimmer has, you know, instances like that where they're like, do I really want to be doing this? Right. And when, um, I've got two that I'll talk about one, when I was 15, um, you know, I was again, the ripe old age of 15. And at that time, you know, I was training on a team that I didn't feel was pushing me really all that hard. And I didn't feel like I was improving. And I was also going to the ice hockey rink all the time with my brother who, um, is, is a hockey player. And I was skating with him regularly and I was actually starting to like heavily consider getting into playing ice hockey. So I sat down with my parents and said, well, you know, I'm not really enjoying this anymore. I don't feel like I'm improving. Like maybe I should, you know, stop swimming and start playing ice hockey. Thank God I didn't do that. But we um, we sat down and talked through the issues that I was having. And it turned out that it wasn't because my commitment to the sport was was failing. That wasn't why I was considering moving on. I just wasn't in an environment that was sort of pushing me. I wasn't getting what I needed out of out of my training scenario. So, uh, you know, we made a change and, and kind of the rest is history. And then the one other one that I'd bring up is so I'm from Southern California originally, like I'm from the land of, you know, uh, sunny skies and great weather. Right. And I wanted to go to a place for college where I was going to get all four seasons. And at the University of Michigan, I got a lot of those uh, colder seasons. <laughs> and um, when you're when you're in um, at Michigan and your freshman year, you're not supposed to have a car. Um, at least that was kind of like the unwritten rule when I was there. So everybody stayed in the dorms, and the dorms were. I don't know, maybe a mile from the, uh, I don't think it was quite a mile actually, it was maybe a half mile, three quarters of a mile from the from the pool. And, and we used to have to walk to morning practice. And there was one morning where it was like, I'm not even kidding you, the wind chill was like minus 25 or something like that. 
And I just remember walking to practice and like my face hurt, my lips hurt. It hurt to breathe. It was so cold. And I walked on deck and Bob Bowman, who was the coach at uh, coach at the time there, he looks at me and says, you know, he thought he was being funny. I didn't find it that funny. He goes, nice and toasty for you out this morning. And I just shook my head. I was like, do I really want to be doing this? And, um, you know, thankfully I kept at it, but there are a lot of, I think a lot of times when somebody's commitment is going to be questioned throughout the course of their career. Right. And I find that the people who end up being the most successful in this sport, depending on your definition of success are the ones who can kind of weather those tests of your commitment. And like I said earlier, like the, the more that you can be committed almost to the point of like flying headlong, blind, deaf and dumb into whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. I feel like that's, that's a pretty good place to be personally. Yeah. Yeah. Carlos, there's many forms of commitment for swimmers, and I want to talk about some of those uh, individually. So was there ever a time where you had to change your stroke or a coach wanted you to change the way that you were swimming and you had to commit to the new way of doing that stroke? Yeah, actually, that happened very recently. Um, that's something that my coaches are always trying to help me improve is just my stroke. When I came to the United States, I had in my mind that my stroke had always to be the same in order for me to be fast or like me to be successful. So whenever they would give me advice or tips or recommendations for me to change my stroke, I would always deny it. I would be like, no, my stroke is fine. Like I just need to improve in my training or like my strength, my starts, my turns, like my stroke is fine um, until like, my junior or senior year, my coaches started, like, they sat me down and they were like, okay, listen, like, if you're going to get to the next level, like, you got to improve in these things. Like, if you, like, then we watched a lot of video and I was like, okay, I see your point. And then I, I talked to Vlad, which is, he's my coach, uh, Vlad Polyakov, and he has helped me a lot changing my stroke. And it's very difficult at the beginning because it feels so weird, you know, uh, like, changing your technique can be, so hard at the beginning and you feel so uncomfortable and you tell yourself you're like okay maybe it's gonna be fine but then when you're like struggling in hard sets with the new stroke and maybe not going as fast mm. you you start doubting yourself and you're like okay should i go back to my old stroke but mm. uh but has always been there for me he's always like just commit to your new stroke commit to it like that you'll see that it'll pay off at the end and that's something that this past year um has been helping me a lot just changing my new stroke uh and now it feels really good uh, but yeah so i try to commit to my new stroke and even when i'm racing like i try not to think about it but the first few like races when i changed my stroke back like practically since the beginning like it was like i had to be in my mind and like think about it like think about my shoulders opening up my hips and just like everything like very specific and that's really yeah. interesting point because you know, I've talked about this. I think I spoke about this in a certain way a couple of times last week. It's like one of the beautiful parts about or one of the beautiful aspects about everybody being out of the water right now is that it's kind of like hitting the reset button. Right. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times when you have to when you change your stroke, you have to kind of take a couple of steps back before you can take four or five steps forward. And the beauty is, is that since we're all out of the water right now, we can all kind of break down our stroke and think about and visualize some improvements and then start over with a clean slate instead of having to really work to overcome some of the, the muscle memory and maybe some of the bad habits that we've created for ourselves over the course of time. Because as swimmers, we do the same thing over and over and over and over again. And that makes changing our stroke and some of our habits really, really difficult, right? So, uh, you know, as far as commitment goes during this time period while we're all out of the water, like I think everybody should be committing to understanding that they can make some really big improvements right now, even though they're out of the pool, as long as they're really utilizing a lot of stroke video, as long as they're really utilizing a lot of visualization, as long as they're really utilizing, um, you know, the, the breaking down of what they're doing and like kind of taking a, a self inventory of how they've been performing and think like, how can I change that when we get back in the water? Cause we are going to get back in the water. 
-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for me, Tyler, it wasn't a, um, a change in my stroke. It was actually a change of stroke. So when I was uh, when I started swimming, I was uh, 12 years old, and uh, all the way up to 17, I was actually a backstroker. So I uh, I could have taken you on at the Olympics if I had stuck with it, but no. <laughs> I, was a, I was a decent backstroker. But for some reason, my coach saw in me that I could be a, a great freestyler, and I just didn't see it. I didn't believe it. Uh, freestyle always felt really odd to me. Um, I didn't have very good balance in my stroke, but. He saw something in me that I didn't see at the age of 17. He said, no, I want to make you a freestyle. And I was pretty attached to being a backstroker at that stage. Like I enjoyed, I enjoyed breathing, you know, I liked having my head out of the water. Um, but uh, so he flipped me over to my front and he said, no, for this season, we're going to concentrate on just freestyle. I barely did any backstroke and I really missed it. But by the end of the season, because I committed to what he saw, even though I didn't see it myself, I actually uh, ended up finishing fourth at, at the national championships in the 50 freestyle, and the rest is history. I mean, I was in love not only with freestyle but with sprinting, so that was kind of a win win for me. Um, you know, talk to us, Tyler, about, you know, you're a 400 IMer as well. Uh, Carlos, did you ever do any 400 IMs? Yeah, uh, practically that's something that I had to do my whole life. It's not like I'm very good at the 4 a.m., but just for training purposes yeah. and when it's not really a, just a training meet, I would swim the 4 a.m. Not yeah. that I loved it, but I had yeah. to. <laughs> yeah, so Tyler, how do you commit to being a 400 IM when every, everyone else around you is, you know, doing half the work that you're doing? So, and, and maybe this means I'm kind of a, a sick and twisted individual, but I always um, – I always sort of enjoyed being one of those people that was known as being good at one of the hardest and most painful events that is in pool swimming, right? I don't think there are many people out there that would disagree that the 400 IM is probably the most painful event in the sport. And I just always, I felt like, and whether or not this was true, I don't know, but I just always felt like I had a decent ability to be able to manage pain and just suck it up and keep going. And I always felt like through my training, which was usually very um, volume intensive, meaning I was doing lots and lots of yards um, and doing a lot of IM work, I felt like that was a good way for me to be because it allowed me to train for the 200 butterfly, the 200 free, the 400 free, the 200 backstroke. Um, and all I had to do was kind of focus on that one event. In fact, I would say that the grand majority of my training was more 400 IM focused. And, you know, if anything, my backstroke in London was kind of just a bonus because of the training that I had been doing for the 400 IM, which is hilarious that I ended up being successful in the 200 backstroke. And like I did do a lot of backstroke training, but in my mind, it was mostly like the 400 IM was my event and just sort of committing to it and knowing that like there's a point in the race. And I think you could say this about somebody's season is that there, there comes a point in everybody's season where they start to question what they're doing and whether or not they think they can push harder. And I think there's also a point in the 400 IM where everybody starts to question whether or not they can continue to push that hard and, and whether or not they think they can, you know, back off just a little bit and still and still win the race. Right. But in, in the 400 IM, I just always felt like and part of it is because my breaststroke was so bad was that I really had to commit to that first 200 and know that I was going to be you know, dealing with some high amounts of pain like that down to your bones and tendons type of pain. I didn't get and that I just, respect you free, so. <laughs> well, I did. Um, but I just I just always felt like, like if I just commit, if I tell myself, like, there's no way I'm going to give anything less than everything I have right now through my training and through my ability to deal with pain, I don't think there's anybody out here that can beat me right now. And I just always thought that put me in a really great spot mentally or a really great mental space before I went into that race. Yeah. Carlos, uh, both you and I have come from foreign countries. I came from Australia. You came from Venezuela. Uh, what was the decision behind you committing to come to America? Uh, something very interesting. Both of my parents were uh, professional tennis players. So I also played tennis until I was like 12. 
but they both came to the United States and they both came to college. So whenever I was growing up in my mind was always, uh, you know, I wanted to come to the States, even if I didn't, if I wasn't in a sport, uh, I just wanted to come and uh, study here in the U.S. I went to their school. My dad went to Tennessee and then transferred to the University of Maryland uh, with my mom. I visited both schools with them. Uh, so it was really cool. And when I was growing up, that was always a goal of mine, right? Um, so whenever I started swimming really fast, I was like, hey, this is actually, this can actually happen. I can make it to the U.S. and get a scholarship and be able to swim uh, because at home you can really swim and go to college at the same time. That's very, very hard. Uh, very few people are able to do it um, and succeed at it. So that's something that in my mind, I told myself, if I want a degree, I also want to keep swimming and I also want to be successful in swimming. That's something that I wanted to do. Uh, even if it was swimming uh, short course yards, that's something that it was really hard for me to commit at the beginning of my freshman year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's different. It's yeah. different. Well, listen, we're all we're all in um, a situation right now where we're in quarantine and it's easy to fall off your commitments. It's easy to lose track of your commitments. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not an athlete, but I struggle to um, just stay in a rhythm of whatever my normal rhythm is, you know, and it's tough because it's like, well, why am I? Why? You know, like you have that. Well, why? And so mentally you kind of drop off. Are you experiencing that as an athlete now that you can't get in the pool? Are you having some lapses in commitment in your mind as well? Uh, yes, uh, that's something that's super normal. And some days I'm really excited to work out. And um, I try to work out at least twice a day, just kind of having a double mindset, uh, kind of having a day of recovery on Wednesdays that we usually have. And then some days kind of off and just try to do some yoga or something. But some days are better than others. But it's okay, and I have tried to tell myself that it's okay that not every day I'm going to be super excited to work out, you know. Uh, and I think I tell myself that uh, I have to be okay with it, with the situation that's going on. Everybody's going through the same things. Uh, so not every, every day I'm not going to be super excited about working out. And then some days I'm just like, okay, this was good enough for today, but what can I get better today? What can I get better tomorrow? So like every day I try to do something better than what I did yesterday, even if it was, I don't know, uh, doing a stretch cords or stretching for half an hour and focusing on getting better at my hips or, you know, something, little things, but they're, they have been helping me stay sane and stay committed to this process. Yeah, that's a good point. Tyler, what are some of the things you think that kids at home could be doing to stay committed to being uh, a great athlete right now? Well, uh, there's, you know, we kind of covered some of these things earlier, right? And I think that, again, you know, visualization, um, goal setting, um, obviously staying as in shape as you possibly can. And I think one thing that a lot of swimmers are doing well right now is that they're doing a lot of uh, a lot of dry land and, and strengthening exercises. And that's great. But Swimming is such an aerobically intensive sport, meaning it's, you know, really hard on your heart and your aerobic system that we need to be training that system as well. So running, biking, jump roping for a while, like anything you can do to get your heart rate up for a little while and even do small sets of, of uh, elevated heart rate type of work, I think would really help. But I think just more than anything, I, I think the perspective is what really, really matters right now. Because, you know, we get asked all the time, Brett, you know this, you see this all the time, like, you know, what, what should I do? Like, you know, when are we going to, when are we going to open up the pools again? When can I get back in the water? You know, what can I do while the pools are closed? And everybody's focused on the fact that pools are closed. And I don't think there's enough um, attention being paid to the fact that like this is going to end. I mean, we're already seeing in a lot of parts of our own country. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, things are going to end in the next week or two as far as uh, quarantine goes. But we're already seeing in a lot of parts of the country that, you know, they may be past their apex on, you know, the number of infections. And, and as that that trend line continues to come down, that means that pools are going to open. Um, and I think as long as people realize that it's just a matter of time before I get back in the water 
and let that be your sense of urgency to keep in shape, to keep visualizing your strokes, to keep looking at stroke video and drills and that kind of stuff to make sure that your mind is tuned up for that when for that time um, when we get to get back in the pool. I don't know if that answers the question, you know, maybe it does in a roundabout way, but that's just my well, thought on it. Well, even the fact that there's 300 people on the live webinar right now means they're committed to learning and growing. And we appreciate that. Thank you for coming on our webinars. Um, we, we don't want it. We don't want every single webinar to be an hour, hour and a half. You know, we want to be able to have, you know, concise information. So we're going to try and keep this one to 30 minutes. Um, we appreciate Carlos coming on here with us today, but I want to open up to questions. So I'm going to enable the chat right now and uh, we can just kind of look at the chat and you guys are, feel free to ask us any questions on the chat that uh, you may want to ask. Okay, there we go. Chat should be open again. Um, shade, we'll do some shout outs. Avery McDowell, how you doing? Hope Souther, shout out. Julie Schmidt, I've seen her name. Lucas Knapp, you're on there a lot. Thanks for coming back. So how, um, Carlos, here's a good question for you. How would you yeah. go about talking to your parents about maybe the desire to switch teams? Uh, that's something that actually happened to me uh, a year ago, I would say, after I was done with school, I was thinking of, you know, trying something different after just for my professional career, just uh, I wanted to move. And it was a talk that I had to have with my parents. And just I did a lot of digging and I just wanted to see what program was best for me. But I sat them down and I was like, hey, this is how I'm feeling. I'm feeling like I have been here for too long. I just kind of want to try something new, something that could work for me. Um, I have heard that uh, this coach is really good. Um, what do you guys think? And my parents are super upfront and they always want what's best for me. So uh, I feel like all kids' parents have the same, the same, like the best interest at heart. So they can be like, okay, listen, like we don't think like it's a, your best decision to move here or to move there. For me, it was a big move. I had to move to Virginia. Uh, that's something that I did and I tried for nine months and then I had to move back. So uh, that's something, <laughs> moving back, that's something that I also had to sit down with my parents and be like, hey, this is not working out like I wanted it to. Uh, what do you guys think for me moving back? And they were like, okay, listen, like it's gonna be really hard going back to your same training, but it's something that you know it works for you, uh, like what's best for you for right now, a year prior to Olympics. So what can we do to help you? So that's something that parents always have the best interest at heart for their kids and just having to talk to them. And sometimes, you know, having to figure out what you need, uh, it's also very important. I think uh, that age group is uh, like swimming, like, Practices can be very like different. Uh, I feel like I could swim a lot when I was little. Right now, I can swim a lot too, but a lot of people can. You know, like a lot of sprinters like cannot do more than like three thousand, four thousand. Um, so I think it's very individual. But when it when I was like under seventeen, I could literally go anywhere and just train a lot of yardage, and I feel like I would be able to swim fast. It's, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a great response. This is my Instagram. If you want to follow me on Instagram, Carlos, what's your Instagram? People want to follow you. Car wait, Carlos, I, I can put it up here. Wait. Yeah, here. And then I'll write my Instagram in here too, just I, in I, case. I type mine in. I type my Instagram in. I'm going to type it again. Give me a follow on Instagram. I saw a question there from one of the parents. How do you, uh, how do you help keep your kids motivated right now during quarantine? Um, and I know I have kids myself. I got two twin girls upstairs right now. Where's Carlos? There he is, Carlos Clavery. Okay, perfect. Let's give that a follow, everybody. Olympian going to a second Olympics next year. Hopefully. Uh, <laughs> yes, of course. Here's a good question. Um, as for stroke analysis, is it more helpful to watch pro swimmers like the video analysis that we're doing on Fridays, or his or own his or her own past swims? And I think the question, the answer to that is yes. And I'm not trying to, you know, be cheeky or anything like that, but you know, you should be watching as much video as you can of high level swimmers as possible to have like that 
understanding and, and um, visual in your mind of what high level swimming looks like. But you should also be watching video of yourself too. Swimming is a really interesting sport in that we, you know, we're get we get told a lot about how to do certain things with our arms and how to do certain things with our heads, but we don't get a lot of visual feedback. So a lot of it is just based off of, um, you know, what we think we're doing. And until you have that actual visual input of being able to watch yourself on video you don't know what you're doing. So I think, yeah, you should be watching our video analysis um, webinars. I think you should be watching a lot of your own video and you should be trying to compare those two videos to see what you're doing right and what you you know, maybe should be improving upon. Yeah. Question here, Carlos, what did you swim at the last Olympics? I swam the 100 and 200 meter breaststroke. Breaststroke, okay, how'd you do? Uh, I made semifinals in the 200 breaststroke. Excellent. I got 14th. Yeah. Great. 14th of the Olympics in the last Olympics. He's going to improve on that this time, next time around. Yes, uh, <laughs> good questions here. So we appreciate all the questions. Um, in terms of motivation, um, it's hard to motivate somebody uh, if they don't want to be motivated. You know, a lot of a lot of motivation can come can, needs to be internal, especially with swimming because swimming is such a tough sport. Like. Uh, you know, if somebody told me that they're going to train me for the 400 I am, I didn't care how motivated they were. I wasn't going to swim the 400 I am, you know, so it's like <laughs> there, there needs to be an internal motivation as well. Um, I think there has to be some belief. There has to, there has to be a reason, you know, like when Carlos changed his stroke, his coach gave him a reason of why he wanted him to change his stroke, you know, so give your kids a reason to, to get up and do things. Um, I also believe in, um, being an example for your kids. So if you want them to be motivated, then show motivation. If you want them to work out, get up and work out with them, you know, encourage them to do it with you or whatever it is. Or if you're going to go for a bike ride, get out and go for a bike ride, all of you together. Uh, take the families on walks, maybe go for a jog, uh, whatever it is, encourage them, but be the example as well, because I think it's important for them to see that you're motivated in this time as well. You can't expect something from somebody else if you're not projecting it yourself. That's, that's my feeling. All right, what else have we got here? Any other quick questions before we take off? Uh, I saw something about not being pushed enough. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of, I, there, there are things like that, yeah, but I think that the first thing you need to do in terms of responsibility is look at yourself. Are you pushing hard enough? It's not so much as somebody pushing me hard enough. Are you pushing yourself hard enough? So if you're in a group that doesn't work very hard, then, then make sure that you outwork everybody 10 times more. It, it shouldn't be a situation where um, you're waiting for everybody else to work in order for you to work, you know, be the person that leads by example. I always say this, you know, if you, whatever you want, go and get it. Don't wait for somebody else to try and give it to you or motivate you to get it. Go and get those things. And that's where Tyler talked about goal setting, write down your own personal goals. What are they for yourself? And then go and aim for those and, and bring people up to where you are. Don't drag, don't get dragged down to where they are. All right, Carlos. All right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the no. worst thing you can be doing, the worst thing you can be doing is the exact same thing as everybody else. So if there's something that you know to be good, that you know is good for you, and a lot of other people around you aren't doing it, then that's probably means you should be doing it. But it's against our instincts to go and it, it's it's part of our instincts that we should be doing what everybody else is doing. That's why when you're out, like right now, when, you know, if you were to go out in among some of the big cities and everybody's wearing a face mask, you're naturally going to feel like you want to wear a face mask, right? But we have to find a way to change that, that, that method of thinking, you know, so we know that goal setting works. We know that visualization works, but a lot of young swimmers out there think it makes them look weird or, you know, they think it's weird that nobody else is doing it. And they're like, oh, well, I guess I just won't do that. Break out of that train of thinking. Find way, you know, find a way to get yourself to do the goal setting, do the visualization. I know that stuff works and I want everybody that's watching right now to challenge themselves to, to get that stuff going for them. Something that my uh, 
psychologist uh, has told me ever since I started swimming uh, here in the U.S. was that visualization helps so much and high level athletes have to do it. You know, uh, if you want to become the best and you want to be uh, like really good, like you want to be at a high level, you got to do it. Like you just like don't go out and train and come back. And then all of a sudden you're like when you feel like everything is crashing when you are at a meet or something or things don't go your way. Uh, you know, like that visualization brings you back to like that peaceful place to knowing that you have everything in control. So I think that's something that we can work on for sure now that we're at home and we're not uh, being able to go swim. But that's something that has been helping me a lot, just visualizing my stroke a lot. And more so now that I have been changing it and focusing on like having a really good line and even visualizing meets coming up. You know, I always visualize really high level meets and how I'm going to react after every turn of like, if things go uh, like bad, like it, I cannot visualize a perfect race every time. Sometimes I visualize me being behind by two body lengths. Sometimes I visualize me going out too fast. I don't know, just like having different kinds of perspectives when it comes to the actual racing. Yeah, Carlos, totally. um, that's good advice, man. I like that. Visualization is very key. We've all done it and yeah. it's helped us uh, grow as professional athletes. And it's something that you learn. It's a skill that you learn. Uh, I, w I want to say this, Carlos, one of the hardest times for me as an athlete was going home for Christmas. Why do you think it was so difficult for me to go home for Christmas as an athlete? Because you did not want to come back? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no. I was, I'm, I'm thinking from an athlete perspective. Like You would eat a lot? No one in my family w wanted to be a, an Olympic swimmer. Only yeah. me, you know. So when I go home for Christmas – they're eating and drinking, relaxing and having a good time. And they're telling me to do the same as everybody else in the family. I was like the, I was like the black sheep in the family. I was the odd person out. Like I wanted to go to the Olympics. No one else in my family and my cousins and my uncles, my aunties, none of them wanted to be Olympic athletes. So when we got together for Christmas, it was just a big party. And I used to drive me crazy because I'm like, I'm an Olympic athlete and you're not, and you're forcing me to do the things that you're doing. I, I, I don't force you to do the things that I'm doing, but uh, so Christmas was always a difficult time for me. And it's kind of, it kind of got that same feeling in quarantine now is like you're being forced to do something that is really goes against what you believe in and what you, what you know. And, you know, you want to push, you want to go out, you want to work out, you want to be, you want to be different and you're being forced to hold those things back. So it's definitely a period uh, of time that I can relate to. Um, it's just extended a lot longer now. So um, listen, look, uh, it's been what almost forty minutes. So listen, we appreciate everybody being on here. Tyler, you got a few announcements for us? Yeah. So uh, everybody, you guys will get a uh, an email here in a couple of hours. It's going to have a link back to the website where you can watch the replay of this if you like. You can also go onto our website at fitterandfaster.com/live to sign up for any upcoming events. You can watch all of our past replays at fitterandfaster.com slash replays. Also, everybody should know, and I think most everybody in here probably already does, but everybody should know that we're actually holding um, live online dry land workouts now. They're much smaller session sizes, and you're actually able to get feedback from some of our coaches. So check, uh, check our website out for that. Um, huge value there and we're going to be announcing some great classes coming up here in the next couple of weeks we also have a lot more webinars coming for you next week so uh keep keep paying attention to fitter and faster social accounts and feel free to reach out to any one of us individually if you have any questions yes and coach jim said again congratulations Tyler, on getting married yesterday thank you <laughs> all right guys listen hey carlos we uh, really appreciate your time my friend Thank you so much. I hope we can do it again soon. <laughs> happy birth, happy birthday, Nadia Frutkin. Ah, uh, yes, birthday wishes. Yeah, happy birthday. Okay, love to everybody. Good luck. Stay committed. All right. See yeah. You. Bye. Bye.